So thank you again for joining us this afternoon and welcome to our webinar, How to Select and Use Operational Cybersecurity Metrics. This webinar is presented by the Research SOC, the National Science Foundation Security Operations Center for Research. You can visit us at researchsoc.iu.edu. I am your host, Todd Stone. In just a moment, our presenter today, Susan Sons, who is the Deputy Director of the Research SOC, will give her insights on developing and presenting cybersecurity metrics. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. All participants are on mute today, but you can, we can, you can ask questions and we encourage you to ask your questions. And you can do, use, do that using the question and answer feature on Zoom. We will provide, uh, record this webinar and we'll provide a link on the research SOC page, research SOC backslash webinars when it's ready. It takes two or three days for us to do that. The slides will also be made available then. If you've got tech troubles, we suggest you sign out and sign in. We know that there are many more folks on Zoom today than there were uh, a week or 10 days ago. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Susan Sons. Susan, take it away. Hi, this is Susan Sons. I'm Deputy Director for Research Creating and Using Cybersecurity Metrics. So I've broken this talk into four parts. Um, purpose, selecting metrics, using metrics, and keeping it sane, how to evolve your security metrics over time. Much like a sandwich, the media stuff is in the middle. Metrics with purpose. What is a metric? According to Oxford Americans, Oxford's American Dictionary, a metric is a system or standard of measurement. We've all seen bad security metrics. Um, they tend to build in perverse incentives. Um, they intensify that magic box syndrome, that moment when somebody wants to just buy a piece of technology they think will solve all their problems. Metrics can create a false sense of security if used poorly. They can cause us to spend resources in the wrong places, confuse metrics with subjective or qualitative measurements. We can end up talking about the past instead of the future or get up into the right syndrome. In case you don't know the phrase up into the right syndrome, this is what I'm talking about. You'll notice a time scale across the bottom here and absolutely no label on the y-axis. That's because some people don't really care what the metric is measuring as long as it goes up and to the right. Um, you're gonna hear about this in my hypothetical, but I'm sure a lot of us have heard about this from leaders who just want to see something that goes up and to the right so they know security is okay. I'm gonna talk for a minute about how research SOC got here. Why did we suddenly start caring about metrics? Um, starting to wonder how do we know if we build the security operations center and then are we accomplishing anything or are we just counting pings and counting connection attempts and counting failed logins because it makes us feel good wondering whether when we see a problem did we cause it did the client cause it is it something that nobody caused but we haven't found yet well we wondered all of these things and this is the approach that we've begun to take Good security metrics can do a lot for you. It's about understanding and communicating risk. It's about understanding your current processes and controls. Are they working? Are they working on the things you think they're working on? Finding weaknesses in your infrastructure. Spotting emerging threats is a big one. A lot of people talk about threat intelligence as if it's something that comes from outside and isn't at all about the things that are happening at your own borders. Um, it can help you direct security dollars and effort and get more bang for your buck because you know more about what is really working and about what you really need. Um, it can help you decide what to do next and more importantly, what you need to stop doing. This is a really big one and you're gonna hear me talk about Andrew Jaquith's book quite a bit throughout this talk. Um, I went through a lot of cybersecurity metrics books as I was preparing this talk, and his was the only one that was talking good practical sense. Um, the purpose of risk management is to improve the future, not to explain the past. A lot of metrics that fall down are about talking about the past, not about what do we do next. 
And what do we do next is what I really care about because I can't secure the past. The past already happened. Another great quote from the same book, and there are QR codes on this page if you want to look up that book on Amazon or Goodreads. I have no financial or otherwise ties to this book. I've never met the author. I don't make any money when it sells. I just really liked it after getting frustrated with what else was on the market for this subject. Um, he talks about the mildly belligerent, in his own words, questions he would ask a vendor. Think about your security team as someone who's serving the rest of your project. From their eyes, you're practically a vendor. You're trying to convince them to take money away from the thing they most care about doing to support this thing you want to do. You're trying to convince them that this is something that will ultimately support their goals. Even if you're an inside security team, I hate to break it to you, in a way you're the vendor. So you want to be able to answer all of these questions yourself. Okay, we've talked about purpose. We want good metrics that help us plan for the future. How do we get them? I'm gonna get a little bit into selecting metrics next. So five things that make a metric good. Consistently measured, cheap to gather, Expressed as a cardinal number or percentage. That means high, medium, low is not a metric. Good, bad, medium, not a metric. Colors are not metrics. Uses at least one unit of measure and actionable. Now, thanks to ISO 17799, and thanks to some of the things coming out of NIST, we've seen a lot of substitution of risk assessments and audits and people calling those metrics. These are not metrics. None of those things can be consistently measured. When we do a risk assessment, we ask people how risky they think something is. Well, I as a CISO may have a different opinion than Todd as a CISO, even when the facts are identical. That isn't consistent. Cheap to gather, Risk assessments and audits are not cheap. And if any of you have found a way to do it cheaply, please, for goodness sake, let me know. These things can sometimes be expressed in numbers. I'll give them that. Sometimes they're offered a unit of measure and sometimes they're actionable. But unfortunately, they still don't meet the, the needs of a good metric because they're not consistent over time and they're really expensive, so we don't do them very often. The most rigorous organizations tend to do audits and risk assessments about every year, and most organizations do them less often. So I'm gonna offer you a few different ways to look at your metrics. These two you're gonna see overlaid on everything else. What are we measuring? Well, you can measure three things. You can measure your process. Are we doing the things we said we were going to do? Are we doing best practices? Are we doing the things we think we ought to do? Outcome, did the thing we did work? An impact, does it matter that it worked? So an example of a process metric might be, did we do a security exercise? If we did, then we have a yes on that process metric. Outcome, did we get recommendations from our security exercise on things to improve? Okay, impact, over the last two years, have we improved our security according to this security maturity model that we adopted? Those are examples of process, outcome, and impact. What are we doing with the measure? Now these are sort of, these are a little different. When I'm talking about what we're measuring, it's just that. What are we doing with it? It is a little more questionable because a lot of people think that compliance is the thing they're doing when they're doing security. I look at compliance very differently. I look as, at compliance as a set of security risks that I manage. We're lucky here in the NSF space that not all of us have compliance responsibilities to begin with. So we're able to focus on security in terms of the needs of our project. We're able to focus on integrity and availability and when needed confidentiality, but it's not just a set of outside standards. Internally, I look at target metrics and heartbeat metrics. A target metric is something I'm trying to get up to. It's aspirational. This is what we're going for. 
heartbeat metrics are things we're already doing. That's sort of how we make sure things are still going how they're always going. Think of it as a heart monitor on a healthy person. We have it harder here in science than the private sector has. Um, I talked about impact metrics. If you get good impact metrics that you can track, grab onto them with both hands because we don't get them as often. It's a lot easier in the private sector because a lot of things come down to dollars and cents. It's much harder to measure discovery, which is what most of our organization's missions are really about. So we're gonna have to start by understanding those science missions as you've heard from us, as you've heard from Trusted CI, as you've heard from most of the research cybersecurity players. So I'm gonna start with a fictional example, my scientific awesome facility of excellence. I just like the acronym I made up. And they have some science metrics, hours of availability to scientists per instrument, the cost of providing those instrument hours, success in embargoing raw data, availability of the public data archive, scientist satisfaction, which they measure in a twice annual survey. These are the things that the facility cares about. And these are things that we need security for. Those instruments aren't going to be available if they've been taken out by a DDoS or if the network falls down. Embargoing raw data regard requires a certain level of information security and on and on. Now, there are also some mission goals that aren't expressed as metrics by our parent organization. They really care about their reputation, but they don't have a good way to measure it. They care about their ability to secure ongoing funding from NSF. That's usually considered gauche if they publicly use that as a metric, but they care about it. And that gives us two goals that as far as cybersecurity are in opposition to one another. On the one hand, they want the security and IT budgets low because that's considered overhead. On the other hand, they wanna demonstrate that they're being proactive with regard to the integrity and security of the scientific data. The ability to support cutting edge and transformative science. Support of early career researchers through training and accessibility for our instruments and data products and outreach to K-12. So management comes calling. Let's pretend for a moment that all of us here on this call represent the cybersecurity team at SAFE. Never mind that we have a ginormous cybersecurity team given that this, this webinar is pretty well attended. Management wants two to five metrics that will demonstrate consistent up and to the right. They don't seem to care if those metrics mean anything. We don't currently have any security metrics that are tracked and recorded. We have a Zeek installation, but with only basic configuration and we have no visibility into our science DMZ. Zeek is our only monitoring so far. So Safe CISO has told our team that it's time to brainstorm some real useful metrics. We don't have any compliance requirements, so that leaves target metrics and heartbeat metrics for, in our scope. We care a lot about process outcome and impact, but impact is unusually hard to measure, and I've just talked about why. So our team starts brainstorming. There are nine sort of subject matter areas where we might want to collect some metrics. Um, I'm not going to read them all aloud to you, just so that you know, endpoints E is enterprise endpoints. This is when we talk about people's desktops and laptops. This is when we talk about servers. O endpoints, that's your operational technology. Those are PLCs, those are HMIs, all of that control system stuff that you probably have in and around your scientific instruments. I separate these because it's pretty different what you can do with them in terms of security controls and in terms of what they can report for monitoring. So I usually think of them pretty separately. All of these other areas you're probably already familiar with. So as we're brainstorming, my team's decided that since we've been asked for a couple of metrics right now, and we don't have a lot of monitoring in place, we're gonna start with some low hanging fruit. We identified three areas where we think that we can generate metrics from things we already have. Email, the cybersecurity program, and incident response. So looking at some email metrics, 
Um, one of the big ones for us is how much of our project staff is actually on our email service. This is one you won't find in the books because most of the books are written assuming normal private enterprise or normal government agencies. Here in academic research, what we find is some of our staff use our email service. Some of our staff have home institutions and like to use that email service. Some of our staff are contractors and use their own email service. Um, which means that we might not know a lot about where their email is coming from or going or how their spam protection is working or what's going on with phishing. So knowing how much of our staff we really understand the email conditions for is really important. It doesn't necessarily mean that we push everyone onto our infrastructure, but we should know how much we really can and can't account for. Um, email volume. How much email are we really handling? Um, spam volume. How much of what we're getting is actually spam? Spam and fish detection. How often are we successfully detecting these problematic emails? How many false positives? How many false negatives? Believe me, if you give your user base a chance to tell you when you've given them false positives and false negatives, they will tell you. Um, malware detection. Hopefully you have malware detection in place on your email server, both incoming and outgoing. And hopefully you're running fix phishing exercises. But these are all things that are fairly easy to do from your existing email infrastructure if you have it, which makes them nice low hanging fruit metrics if you need a place to start. Program metrics. So a lot of these are things that um, you're probably not going to do all of them at once if you're just going for that early low hanging fruit. But these are all things you can use to kind of push your management on things that need to get looked at, especially offboarding, shadow IT. These are common low hanging fruit problem areas to fix. And if you find out that they're not as bad as you feared, those are great places to reward other teams for participating in the process and making things more secure. It's a great place to get buy-in for your next steps. Um, and these are also things that you should be able to fill in even if you haven't been doing any metrics in the last year. You should know if you've been running training. You should know if you have a whole bunch of policy violations or if you have no way of finding out. Um, you should be able to go through and do a quick look around for, uh, for accounts belonging to people who are no longer part of the project. You should know if you've done policy review. So again, I'm looking at low hanging fruit here as our hypothetical easy place to start. Um, and no small group of metrics that start as the low hanging fruit is itself going to cover your whole security program. The idea is to get people used to using metrics so that you can slowly expand your metrics program as you automate more and more of it. So the last group that we talked about were incident response metrics. The biggest pressure that I'm seeing in scientific groups right now is they want to use the number of incidents as a primary metric. I really try to push any IT group away from considering that a major metric. We certainly track the number of incidents Incidents. However, when you consider how many incidents have we had and what severity are they as our main metric of how good the security team is doing, what happens over time is you get a security team that downplays incidents. They don't want to declare an incident if they don't have to, or they rate the incident in a lower secure severity than it ought to be rated. Because at this point, their performance evaluations have been tied to the number and severity of incidents. And whether something is an incident and how severe it is, is always a judgment call. And that's a really nasty, perverse incentive, reminiscent of a particular coding shop I worked in a long time ago as a contractor. And I found out that a lot of their problems stemmed from rating their programmers primarily on who wrote the most lines of code in a given day. Um, instead, I tend to look at things like, do we have synchronized network times so that when we get logs, we can actually correlate them in an incident? I look at what is actually being monitored and how much of our infrastructure does that represent? I look at whether we are actually following our process when we have real incidents or when we do incident response exercises. 
I look at how fast does my team respond when we have an alert or an internal notification of a potential incident. Um, these are all things that get way further into our ability to respond than how many incidents did we have and how severe were they. Um, the amount of frustration that I see in a security team when they feel like they're being graded on something that's largely beyond their control because they don't maintain the infrastructure and they don't maintain the code is pretty high. So um, while it's good to track your incidents, um, tracking all of these other things is more important. So our hypothetical team has found some metrics on our security program, on incident response, on email. These were our low-hanging fruit to start a metrics program. That still leaves us six areas where we want to start building out metrics as time passes. And these are all equally important areas. The reason that I went with those three first was not because they're better or more important, but because they were low-hanging fruit for a team that didn't have a lot of automation yet. And the metrics game is really about making things cheap to monitor and easy to monitor. That means constantly rolling out automation and then working to improve something till it gets up to the target. And then that target metric becomes a heartbeat metric. So we've talked a little about selecting metric, uh, selecting metrics, say that 10 times fast. That was skimming the surface. This is a really big topic. And I absolutely encourage you to get a hold of the Jayquith book I mentioned because it does a really good treatment of all of the areas I discussed, except for the operational tech. It was very focused on enterprise technology, but we'll be putting out more information from Research SOC on working with operational technology in the future. So don't worry, we're not gonna leave you hanging there. Next, I'm gonna talk about using metrics. So, I broke down effective metrics usage into five steps. As you just saw in the hypothetical, we start with what's cheap and easy. There's a lot of desire to go for the best metrics that most accurately and fully describe your program first, but that delays your getting a metrics program started for a really long time. The best thing is often just to get your organization accustomed to using security metrics as early as possible and then improve that program over time. Um, systematically eliminate unknowns and mature your program. Look for things that you don't know enough about in order to secure them, and that's going to end up being foci for your metrics. Look for places where you don't think that you're up to snuff, and that's going to end up being a foci for your things secure and also what's important to making others within the organization really care about security. Um, enlisting other teams and improving security is a big thing and letting them know that there's somewhere where they can compare themselves to other teams within the organization or to other science organizations is really big. Um, let people feel like they can accomplish something. One of the biggest problems we have with recruiting non-security people into making security better is their feeling that this is an endless task and that they can never really win. Um, metrics are a really powerful tool for getting rid of that feeling because while we will always be going for a more, more mature program to a point, letting people have something to compare them to so that it's not an infinite field is really, really helpful to getting them on board. Number four, finding efficiencies and making vendors prove their value. Um, this is a really big one for me personally because I have watched security teams struggle when they say, I have 80% of my budget for magic boxes and equipment and I have 20% of my budget for people. Showing leadership where your budget will get them the most security is really powerful and making vendors prove that they can actually give you something worth having is really powerful. Being able to turn around to a vendor and say, okay, this is what I'm getting from my current email gateway solution. Give me a demo system. We're gonna run it for six weeks and if you can beat this number, we'll consider buying it. That's really nice instead of just trusting the vendor when they say that their box is magic. You'll actually have something to go on. The last one is 
old metrics should never retire. They just go from target metrics to heartbeat metrics. Once we've achieved something, we don't want to watch the organization backslide. Um, and those heartbeat metrics let us know that we're still doing well. And when we're not, it lets us notice a problem before it becomes a catastrophe. Too often, I see organizations that find out that the thing that they solved isn't solved anymore when they have an incident. Those heartbeat metrics, those automated checks, become your safety net. When something changes in the infrastructure, something that the security team thought was solved a long time ago, your heartbeat metrics can tell you before it's exploited, instead of you discovering because of the exploit. So the really big traps that even security people don't always see coming when it comes to instituting a metrics program. The first one is watching out for absolutism. Not every metric needs to go to 100% or 0%. And sometimes they can create perverse incentives. Keeping an eye out for how a metric will be seen by other people and what they're going to try to do once they start getting feeling that they're graded on that metric is going to be an important thing. Watch for the word done. Um, heartbeat metrics, as I just said, are essential. There are people who once they hit the target, they think it's over. Um, and the last two go hand in hand. Um, some people will equate measurement with blame. They will not want something to be measured because they don't want to get blamed. Or they think that you are measuring something because you don't trust them. If you are prepared for those reactions, you will have an answer and you will have a way to work around it. But people who are really loving the metrics and getting a lot of use on them are so prepared to see metrics as good that they don't understand the skepticism of people who aren't accustomed to getting measured. Um, and especially if you can demonstrate that you're measuring outcomes and you're measuring process and you're not trying to measure individual people, it's a winnable battle, but not if you aren't prepared for it. And lastly, some hard to measure things are still important. When we measure things, we direct attention to them, which can be very useful, but you're also di directing attention away from other things, and some of those other things are still important, and not everything that's important is easy to measure. Um, going back to dysfunctional development teams again, um, the team that I was talking about earlier decided to improve things, and instead of measuring lines of code, they decided to start to measure who closed the most tickets. And they even weighted it so that really difficult to close tickets, according to their chief architect, got you more credit than a really easy to close ticket. And what they found really quickly was the senior programmers who'd spent a lot of their time mentoring the junior programmers stop doing that after the first time they didn't get a bonus because they weren't closing enough tickets. So the senior programmers very suddenly were closing a lot of high value tickets and the junior programmers all became less effective. More of their work had to be redone. They were sticking to easier tickets and they simply weren't putting out enough as much work because nobody was measuring mentoring time and effort. And so it started to go by the wayside. Um, we see this in a lot of places when people are doing little things that make security better, but those little things aren't very easy to measure. So that's definitely something to watch out for in your culture. And creating a culture where metrics are seen as warning signs or ways to monitor an ongoing process rather than the end all and be all goes a really long way. In that vein, a big, big thing is how you communicate about metrics. Because when the security people know what a metric means, that doesn't mean anybody else does. Every time you communicate about a metric, and I don't mean the first time you communicate about a new metric, I mean every single time. You need to communicate what are we actually shooting for, why are we doing it, and what's the context around it. You know, here's why we're trying to make sure that phishing attempts don't make it through our email scanner. This is our purpose. This, what we're trying to get to is zero phishing attempts making it through. What's the context? A lot of security compromises start with valid credentials that were gotten during a phishing attack. Letting people know why you do what you do not only breaks down resistance within the organization because people can better understand that you're trying to help them, 
but it also means that you don't get tagged with a purpose that is not your purpose or people don't misunderstand what they should be doing. Um, every communication about a metric needs this kind of context, even if not everybody reads it. Um, as my boss says, he has the rule of seven and a half. If you repeat something seven times, half the people will think you said it once. And that's a really big thing. It may be intuitive to you, it will not be intuitive to other people because other people have less context than you do. Another big one is finding opportunities to connect with peer organizations. When a new exploit is discovered or a new um, venue for an exploit, it usually takes less than 48 hours for the bad guys to systematize it, turn it into a script that any idiot can plug into Metasploit or another framework and start using. The good guys do not communicate nearly as efficiently and effectively. But metrics is a really good place for us to do more of that because while we may still be fighting internal battles to share what we learn about threats, share information on our incidents, share information on what we're seeing on our networks, there isn't so much private information or information that make our bosses nervous about our sharing in our metrics. Just telling them that, hey, our, the amount of spam we received has gone up 10% in the last quarter. Is anybody else seeing this? Not only does this help us coordinate with peer organizations so that we know if something's changing in our environment, but it also helps us help one another improve our security maturity. Nobody wants to be last in the pack, but how do you know who's last in the pack if nobody knows anybody else's metrics? I've seen organizations that pride themselves on being first in the pack, but they don't actually know they're guessing where other people are sitting. Communicate consistently. Metrics really help you do that internally and externally. The more you talk, the more you have the opportunity to change minds. Um, feel free to talk people not quite to death. You need them alive so you can work with them. But do keep talking. Um, and discover what things people have found effective in their organizations. The thing about our industry, if you like it, our vertical, is that in the scientific IT world, in the cyber infrastructure world, security metrics are not being consistently used yet. And as we each onboard our organizations to these, we're each going to discover that this one's effective and this one's not. And this one caused people to see the wrong thing or worry about the wrong thing. We're all learning what's effective in this unique context, and that's something we can share and help one another with. So we've gotten through purpose, we've gotten through selecting metrics, we've gotten through using metrics. We don't have a lot of time left, so I'm gonna try to get through a really short piece on how to evolve your security metrics over time, and then we should have a good bit of time left for q and I've really tried to condense this so that I'm giving you all a jumping off point to do your own work with metrics, and so that you can start thinking about what's really gonna matter in your organization. So where can metrics get us? At the very, very basic level, metrics can help you get your organization moving. Um, pick something and start maturing it. One of the difficulties in getting an organization working on security is that security is not very visible to them and good metrics can help make something more visible. Um, a lot of our organizations don't even have all their baseline standard controls in place yet. Pick something that is really bothering you that isn't good enough and get your organization moving. When you get past that level, you can start really focusing on fixing or getting rid of what's not working and systematizing what does. Take controls that you believe in, make them more automated, make them lighter weight to implement, make them cover more of your infrastructure. This is a chance to make sure you're putting your resources in the most effective place and free up resources for really maturing your program. That gets me to the next level. Old aspirations become your new defaults. The things that were your target metrics, the things that you were trying to reach for, you've got this. Let it become a heartbeat. That means you know you won't regress, you can focus on what's next. Yeah, everybody wants to be done, but we all know that the landscape's gonna change. Freeing up capacity within your organization means that you can deal with the unknown. Too often we have reactive security teams that are just trying to get done what they need to get done for operations. 
And when that's our life, when the big incident hits or when the landscape changes and we need to change our security infrastructure, we don't have the effort or the budget available to do it. Being ready for what's next means slowly automating more of what we have, slowly freeing up resources so that we have a little bit of stretch room, so that we're doing professional development, so that we're preparing for the thing that we don't know is coming that really does blindside us. So this has been a lot to stick in your heads in a very short time. I hope that you're doing metrics with purpose. I know there are people who just want to see something on a chart that goes up and to the right and they don't care what it means, but you can carefully select metrics so that they are helping you mature your cybersecurity program, so that they are motivating people to do the right thing, and so that the people who are doing the right thing can feel a sense of accomplishment. I hope you're selecting metrics to focus on the things that you need to focus on. I hope that you're using metrics not just to communicate inside your security team, but with your whole organization and with peers and partners outside your organization, not to mention keeping your vendors honest. I hope that you're using security metrics to evolve your security program over time and hopefully save yourself a little bit of sanity by taking something that is often intuitive to people who've worked in security for a long time and making it concrete enough to make it accessible to all the people that you need to work with, that you need to convince, and that you need to get on your side. So that's what we've got. Um, I'm, really help, I'm really hoping that I've got some questions waiting for me and I'll leave it to Todd to pass those on. Thank you, Susan. That was a great presentation. You do have questions waiting for you. The first one's a general question that I'll address. Uh, give us about 30 minutes after the presentation is done, ladies and gentlemen, and those several folks who want the deck, uh, it'll be available uh, just at uh, researchsoc.iu.edu backslash webinars, and you'll find the link there. Susan, our first question, and we'll take these in order, um, Tom Davies asked, could you provide some concrete examples of decisions that were driven, that are driven or were driven by some of the metrics that you talked about? Sure. Um, so in one organization that I was working in as a senior security analyst some time ago, um, my CISO was really, really trying to push to simplify all of our controls around password resets and sort of these gray pigeon things that we have to do over and over every day. And as well, you know, stuff like that, application whitelisting, just the everyday stuff. And he could not get a foothold anywhere. And it, you know, he's trying to be the yes security guy instead of the no security guy. And I looked at it and I said, well, we're not really tracking the number of exceptions. We have an exceptions file, but let's go through it and find out how many there really are. And what we found out was that on average, we were getting a request for an accept, what I call a convenience exception. In other words, an exception so that the leadership can do what they want faster, about twice a week. And that's what we went to the leadership with was not hey, here are all the reasons that our current policy isn't good enough, but you're telling us twice a week that you can't get your job done because of these policies. How many other people in the organization do you think can't get their job done because they're not important enough to get us to make an exception? Um, so that was a really good one. Um, another really good one that we had was just keeping track of how many published security vulnerabilities were still open on our infrastructure. Um, we had a lot of people who thought that monthly patching on our most critical systems was acceptable and that you know every 90 days patching on things that they said had high uptime requirements was great. And so we just started cataloging the number of open vulnerabilities and leadership stopped liking to look at that. So. Great, thank you, Susan. One of our attendees asked that uh, said that on one of our slides we uh, referenced SEIM a couple of times. Could you define that term for us? Sorry, that is a oh god, now I have to remember. Sec Sec I don't even remember what it stands for. It's secure something information 
manager. This is the aggregator we use to grab all of our network information, all of our system logs, and correlate it to find out what the heck is going on. Okay, great. Thank you. Jim Bull from Stevenson University has a bunch of questions. So Jim, we're going to try and get to all those. And, and thank you for your compliment. Uh, he tells it, Susan, he tells it this is good stuff. He's trying to map some uh, infosec metrics to business metrics. In other words, translating metrics into dollars. Uh, but one of the things he, he um, and in slicing metrics by institution department so that they understand the risk to their operations. Any hints for Jim in, in either one of those areas? Um, as far as translating things into dollars, if you can find out how many dollars it really costs when something fails, that's always my starting point. You know, if this goes away, how screwed are you, basically? Um, I'm probably not supposed to word it that way on a webinar that's being recorded, I apologize. Um, but find out what the real costs are and work backwards from that because once you have, what is the cost? What is the risk of it having? I'm sure you've seen this math somewhere. Another thing is um, we know that we don't have decades of actuarial data for every risk. This is not life insurance. I don't know how likely you are to get broken into because of this new device that was invented three years ago and just got installed. So a lot of this risk information is intuition, it's gut, it's experience. Getting beyond that into um, how good is your fallback and what do we wanna put the most into protecting and who's going to assume the risk can make people think differently enough that it helps because we want to bring it down to dollars and cents, but that can be really hard in the science world. It's a lot easier in, say, finance, where we know how many transactions they're running per minute. Okay, I know great. That, that was a wishy-washy answer, but it's a wishy-washy world. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, that was a great answer. Thank you, Susan. Finally, Jim has another question, and I, uh, then we've got just a couple more after, time for a couple more after that. Uh, Jim, and I'm sure some others are building their program on the foundations of the NIST CSF. Do you know of any good resources for mapping metrics to those five key NIS, NIST CFS domains? I don't know of a good resource that addresses that directly, but I will say that the Jayquith book that I referenced earlier has a website in it. Um, let me find the website really quick. It's securitymetrics.org. And if you follow the securitymetrics.org mailing list, there were a couple of people who were talking about that a few months ago, and you should be able to track it down. Okay, great. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, our attendee asked for your thoughts on using ba the balance scorecard, or using a balance scorecard concept to minimize the natural human tendency uh, to skew behavior towards the specific metrics that are measured. Um, I've seen good balance scorecards and I've seen bad ones. Um, the hard part is I, hmm, I think that using them for specific areas. because they're worried about the equivalent of game balance. You know, if you've ever played online video games and they change how one character works, all of a sudden the rest are too weak or too strong. Um, so what happens is it can be pretty good if you're just focusing in on a very narrow area, like here's the scorecard we're going to use on our email security. It can work pretty badly when you try to make it organization-wide because it makes people really resist adding new measurements. Okay, I think we've got time for one or two more. Uh, Robert Bridges asked, uh, uh, noted that you touched on not trusting vendor salesman's claims. And he asked if you could discuss how you test the tools for acquisition, how you, how you use test tools for acquisition decisions. For example, you run an experiment on um, a few tools to ga gauge detection rates and false alerts rates, time to detection, and so on. Um, 
dollar cost? And how do you see all these metrics in a single uh, comparable criteria? Let's start with the first part with kind of what test tools you might have or hints you might have for testing vendor claims. So I'm gonna go with what I like the best and then what I do when I don't have the thing I like the best. What I like the best is when I have solid metrics on the track record of whatever I have now and what my other options are. Because if I already have a tool in place and I know exactly how well it performs, then I can say, okay, give me your tool for X weeks, X months, and I'm gonna run it, and if it performs better than what I have now, we can talk about how much better it performed and how much money it's worth. The problem is I don't always have those metrics. If I do, it's really that simple. If I don't, what I try to do is figure out overall, what do I want out of this product and what is that worth to me? What does it cost for me to build what I want in-house? And then how can I verify if I'm getting what I want and how much of it I'm getting. Um, how to verify can be really tough because vendors can be, a lot of times they just don't wanna give you enough information to make that determination in any realistic fashion, especially when they might themselves be introducing new security vulnerabilities onto your network. When I am in a position to do so, it's, well, if you don't give me that much information, you know, I don't trust you and goodbye. I'm not always in that position. So that given the case, um, what I try to do is schedule vendor testing for a time when everybody else in my organization except the security team is preoccupied with an event or something else that will keep them out of our way. Because that means if we can get a hold of a demo unit or a demo account on a service, we can beat the heck out of it. We can have somebody pen test it. We can have somebody throw bad data at it. Um, we can have somebody test it with sample data that's similar to our environment, but not particularly sensitive. And we'll get what information we can given the time and resources at hand. And when I take that vendor's pro product to whoever's going to approve the purchase, or when I look at approving the purchase, there's, an idea in my head of how much risk this is. And if it's a new product that I don't have experience with, I try to keep my time commitment as low as possible so I can switch to something else if it's terrible. Because a lot of times you just don't know in our environment until after adoption if something's going to live up to its promises or not. Great, thank you, Susan. There's a side question about to what degree you trust the Gardner and NSS reports or other evaluators' reports? I have mixed feelings. I think that a lot of times they're not looking for the same things that I'm looking for. Um, I think that when it's very clear that they're looking for the same thing I am and it's well quantified and it's narrowed down enough, that's great. I don't have any reason to believe that they're outright lying. But I think a lot of the time, the criteria that they're looking for are not the criteria that I think are important, especially when I'm looking at a science context, because most of the organizations that those people are talking to are confidentiality first, integrity and availability maybe organizations. And most of science is integrity and availability first, confidentially maybe organizations. So we can have extremely different criteria for acceptance than their primary audiences. It's a great answer. Thank you so much. Any other questions out there? Look like we've pretty much gone through them all. Just so you all know, we pay Todd to stroke my ego. Well, while you think if you have any last questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we would uh, ask you to connect with Research Sock. You can of course visit our website and subscribe to our announcement list and we'll get you on that for having registered at this webinar. We do have a blog, but one of the things I do want to emphasis, emphasize rather is for you to join our community of practice at askcyberinfrastructure.org backslash slave backslash research sock. If you have a question that you think of after the webinar is over or want more information, please post it there. We have a good community going and we'll get you, uh, you'll get some good responses there. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter at IU Research SOC. 
We do have a couple of things coming up. Um, our next webinar is how to secure scientific data flows and research project, currently scheduled for the 21st of May at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you'll find uh, some more information on that. We should have registration for that up here in a few days. Just uh, pencil us in on your calendar. Um, should, uh, as we all know, Educause Security Professionals Conference, face-to-face uh, -face conference was canceled. Um, we know that they are working on maybe having some virtual presentations. If that happens and if uh, we get some time on there, we'll be sure and let you know. And we join us at the PERC virtual conference in July. That's all we have today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. There's Susan's information. And we will, this concludes our webinar for the day.